I'm Adam Dalton, and I'm the director of bands here at Marshall University. I recently had the privilege of sitting down with Randall Stanbridge, who's a composer, conductor, educator, and we talked about all sorts of things, from composing, to video games, to TikTok, to social media. It was a blast, and I hope you enjoy. Well, hey, Randall, how are you doing today? Oh, doing pretty good, just getting the work day started, and this was the very first thing on my agenda. Nice. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? I think most of our students have probably heard of you and played your music before, but just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, okay. Well, uh, I'm a, pr I mean, I, I'm a pretty boring person, but uh, I, um, I was born and raised, you know, grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, sp specifically the suburbs, like, so kind of the more rural area. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people think Arkansas is just a big rural state, but there are some, you know, somewhat metropolitan areas, Little Rock, of course, being one of them. Um, but having said all that, like my particular upbringing was more in the country area of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, just grew up there, went to Sheridan High School, and then uh, went to college at Arkansas State uh, University in Jonesboro, which is uh, in the northeast corner and not like geographically not very far from Memphis. Um, so okay, if, sure. Uh, so, if, so if your students know where Memphis is, Jonesboro is you know, in that same area, you know, basically the Delta. Okay. Um, you know, the, the big, big flat farmlands by the Mississippi River. Um, cause for instance, like right now I can look out my window that's right by my desk and I can probably see every bit of like 10 to 15 miles just straight that way because there is nothing. It is all flat. Um, all right. especially this, especially this time of year when the harvests have already happened. Cause like, you know, all the oh, sure. soybeans are down, all the, all the corn is down, all you know, all like that. So it's just, it is barren, you know, except it for the occasion, like occasional tree. It is like here in West Virginia. We got mountains oh, yeah. for days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've actually never been to West Virginia. Really? I was, I, yeah, I would love to come sometime, but I've just, I've never been there. Uh, but anyway, so I came up here for school, um, then went to, uh, you know, graduated and became a band director. And I was a band director for 12 years at a small school uh, called Harrisburg. What grade? And um, I, I taught all, all the grades. Um, oh, cool. So all, all, all of the, all of what you would call the band grades. So like sure. I taught the, uh, I taught the fifth grade, um, like recorder band, you know, like the mm -hmm. pre-band stuff. And then sixth grade beginning band, seventh or eight middle school and nine through 12 high school. And I mean, that was all me. Now the last uh, four years of, um, my tenure there, they actually hired an assistant, um, and uh, which turned out to be my husband. Uh, oh, he had applied. Cool. He had applied. Yeah, he had applied for the job. Um, I took, and incidentally, just so nobody thinks like any nepotism went on, um, I took myself out of the hiring process. Like I was like, you know, since he was, um, since he was uh, applying, I was like, I, you know, there is zero chance of me being impartial. I was like, so <laughs> I, uh, I was like, you know, I gonna excuse myself from this i just want the best person for the job sure you know and it just so happened that it turned out to be him you know and oh, that's uh, awesome so so we got to teach together um in rural arkansas because like harrisburg is very very like back you know backwoods country uh -huh. and uh that was kind of interesting um but i mean it wasn't bad either you know so uh um did that then uh d at the end of my tenure i basically came to a point where my composition career had taken off to the point where it was becoming a larger and larger responsibility, you know, meeting sure. publisher deadlines, meeting commission deadlines. And then I think the part of composing that a lot of people don't talk about, which is the business side of it. Cause I mean, if you're going to yeah. be a successful composer, um, I would say about half of being a successful composer is writing really good music. And then the other half is you have to be a really good business person. Sure. And so, and which of course takes time, it takes dedication and thought. Um, and so that was just eating up more and more of my responsibilities. And then of course, you know, I don't have to tell you what being a band director is like. Sure. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a very consuming job and very, you know, you, cause you're doing lessons, you're doing games, you're doing all this stuff. And it got to the point where I just didn't have any personal time. Yeah. And so I was, you know, I just made the decision. I was like, I need to have a life outside of my job or jobs at the time yeah. and uh, decided to go full-time uh, composer and marching arts designer and th that's where I've been ever since. Uh, the only uh, big recent thing I would say is I just recently started my own publishing company. Right. Um, that. And so that so that's kind of new. I mean, we're we're it's about roughly a year old now. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, this has been the first full year, and what a year to do it. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, what's it like? I mean, 
we are used to the big name publishing companies and I, now a lot of composers are moving to making their own uh, publishing companies and doing it their way. What was the decision making process to kind of do that? Why did you decide to do that? And what did it take to make that happen? Well, I mean, there were a few decisions. Um, the, the biggest one, I'm going to be honest, was just uh, financial. Sure. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I, this is, again, a thing I don't think a lot of directors or students know. But composers uh, with big publishing companies, um, the royalty rate, like what you get paid for each piece that you sell is 10%. So, um, which I mean, and, and I'm not griping about that because, you know, when you're running a publishing company, there's a lot of hands in the, you know, in the bucket as it sure. were, because I mean, you're, I mean, you're paying the composer obviously, but then you're also paying distributors, you're paying typesetters, printers. I mean, it gets split up a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, I mean the, uh, roughly like now with, uh, publishing my own stuff, the royalty rate for myself, like and keeping in mind, even with me owning the company and everything like that, you know, I would say my royalty rate is about 40% now. Okay. So still not even half, but, um, but I mean, that's better than it was, you know? Right. Um, and you know, aside from that, uh, I now get to have a little more say in my own direction as far as my music. Right. I was going to um, add that. Well, and you know, because like even within uh, publishing companies, you'll tend to get a little bit typecast sometimes just like, oh, well, you know, you're our March guy or you're right. our guy that writes Christmas stuff or you're our right. guy that, you know, does this. And it's, I'm, I mean, anybody that knows my career and my library of work, um, I have an extremely diverse style. Like nice. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable writing whatever. I mean, you, you give me a style, I will knock it out of the park. I know that sounds incredibly immodest, but it's just that that's a, uh, I, I'm just comfortable doing that. Like, you yeah. know, that's, and that's fine. And I have a lot of musical interests. Like I'm not just interested in one thing and I'm not just interested in one grade level. I, you know, I enjoy writing, you know, university level, really symphonic, you know, heavy mm -hmm. stuff, but I also really enjoy writing the grade one, grade two, you know, younger man things. And to me, they're both equally rewarding. So what um, are you excited about right now? Like, what are you writing right now that you're like super stoked about? Um, what am I writing right now that I'm really excited about? Uh, well, a few things. Um, I mean, the biggest thing this past year, aside from the publishing company, I actually just released my first album. Um, okay. So like it's, I mean, it's on iTunes, it's on, uh, you know, Spotify, Amazon, like all the major streaming platforms. Um, and it's called A New Day Dawns. So okay. I was pretty excited about that. And there will be some more albums upcoming. Um, the pandemic has put the kibosh on that just a little bit. Um, because, you know, of course, a lot of studios aren't meeting because of uh, safety reasons. Right. But, but we are getting things ready, you know, for when that resumes. Um, other than other than that, um, let's see. Uh, I, I'm just about to release a new, um, we're just about to start releasing our, you know, 2021 catalog. Um, and uh, I've got a few things in there that I'm really excited about. One is a young band piece called Shadow Cove March. I just um, saw that online. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're about to start a major advertising push for it because, you know, of course, a lot of bands play marches in the spring. Yep. And uh, this one is a particularly fun one. Um, it's very cinematic sounding and very pirate sounding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just, it's, it's probably my favorite young band march I've written. Um, and uh, which is saying quite a bit because I've written quite a few, um, but I really like this one. I don't know. It's, it's just fun. Like I, I was imagining when I was writing it, like if I was a, you know, a band student, I would enjoy playing this. You know, it's <laughs> like, I, I would look forward to playing this. That's awesome. And um, so, so I'm excited about that. Um, I've got a piece that will be released in the spring. Um, it has kind of a wordy title. Um, it's called um, Fantasia on a Theme by Camille Saint-Saëns. Okay. Uh, and it, it is uh, based on the, the climactic theme of his organ symphony. Okay. Um, so, uh, we, which some, I mean, if any of your uh, students or, you know, anybody who sees this uh, knows, if you don't know that particular piece, if you know the movie Babe, you know, about the pig that was <laughs> yep. released back in, back in, you know, the late nights or whatever, um, the song that the farmer sings to Babe at the end, you know, the, if I had the words I'd make, that's based off that same symphony. And um, so it's that theme. And I just, I just really like the piece because it, it's, it's a lot of what I released this last year had a very strong pops influence, which mm -hmm. I enjoy. And that's def and that is definitely my aesthetic, but this piece is very just kind of straightforward in the symphonic vein. And uh, it's just nice to have that contrast to, you know, again, show people that I can do 
lots of things. You know? Sure, absolutely. And so, so the, the, I would say those are the pieces I'm pretty excited about right now. But now, keeping in mind, like I'm, I'm writing all the time. I've got a piece coming out this year that's a young band that is specifically designed to familiarize students with sixteenth notes. Like young band, this is a great mm -hmm. one, but it uses sixteenths in a very um, manageable way that I think you know will will lock on the kids too and then i've got a very easy grade two piece similarly themed you know it's like it's addressing a specific um a specific educational goal which is going to be teaching young students seven eight time oh that's and so um yeah well it is and uh, yeah. but the thing the thing is um one thing you know, i for me having been an educator i really can't separate um my educational side from my composer side it's to me they're so interlinked um, but one of the things like with that piece and the, and the 16th note piece I mentioned, um, with a lot of composers, it just seems like there's no middle ground. It's like we go straight from not doing it at all to something where it's very tricky, very rhythmic, very, you know, very melodically involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, so what I've done with these pieces is, um, take some of the elements down a notch so for instance you know bring the range down um, make it a little bit more repetitive but repetitive within different orchestrations so you're still getting different color mm -hmm. um but then also like even like within well the seven eight piece for example um th there's not a lot of different rhythms it's it's a lot of I, I think i chose between five or six actual like rhythms the whole the whole piece is nothing but five or six rhythms used in different ways and the idea being that when you reduce the rhythmic vocabulary the students will be able to absorb it more readily sure and so uh, so that was the goal and uh, that piece is called sparrow um, s p e uh, s p e r o so uh, latin for hope right right and um, it's uh, it's just a really fun high energy piece so aside from the whole educational aspect it's just a hell of a piece <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and it takes a special type of person to be able to look and create a great piece that's also strong for education and and works well in in, in a curriculum so that's really awesome oh yeah yeah because a lot of times that stuff can end up sounding like an etude mm-hmm um, and, uh, you know, that's the trick is how do you make it still sound like music, like an actual sure. orchestrated thing. So, yeah. and I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm going to keep it to myself for now because <laughs> it's trade secrets, you know? Sounds good. <laughs> do you write for anything besides band? I was looking through your catalog and it seems like you have a very diverse catalog of things. So what else do you do besides band? Um, well, I primarily do, uh, you know, I primarily do band, right. but I am starting to expand. And that was one of the other goals with creating my own company was to allow myself to expand into other areas. Um, so I do concert band and I write quite a bit for marching band. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually where I got my biggest start was in marching band. Um, I do some writing for orchestra, um, both string and full orchestra. Um, then I, I've begun doing some writing like on my own for uh, choir. Okay. Uh, so with some vocal pieces. Um, and I'm looking, you know, I've done also some uh, chamber ensemble music. I've got a couple of percussion ensembles out. And uh, then I'm also looking at expanding into jazz um, because I love jazz. And I, I, I mean, I was in jazz band mm -hmm. and I, I enjoy What's writing your instrument? for it. Uh, my main instrument is percussion. So as percussion. I like to tell people, yeah, as I like to tell people, I, I are a percussionist, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, I uh, would definitely like to write for that. <clears throat> and I've even done just a very, very little bit. I mean, this is going to sound grander than it is, but I've done a very little bit of film scoring. Um, I've got a couple of short films that I have uh, done, you know, done the score for mainly just for fun because it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things like it's something that always interested me. Right. And uh, so I'm just like, why not? You know, why not do this? I think that would be so um, fun. Oh, it was. Yeah. And um, but weirdly enough, both of the ones I've done so far have been comedies, um, which, as I discovered, like as I was writing for it, is really hard because you're, uh, you know, the music can really help land a joke or it sure. can it can, you know, just flatline it like it can just not help it at all. And uh, so uh, so that was that was an interesting experience. And I've actually got a piece that will be coming out from the first film score I did that's going to be based around that score. Um, that's nice so, yeah awesome so a lot of us are working with these flex band and adaptable band instrumentations now during this pandemic and we're doing quite a few here at marshall have you done any of those and what's that experience been like for you 
Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I have written several of those, uh, both for my own company and for my various publishers that I write mm -hmm. for. Um, last time I, I looked at my list, I think I've got around 16 flex pieces out. Um, wow. So yeah, yeah, quite a few. Um, and uh, it's, the flex pieces, like on the one hand, um, it's rewarding only because um, you know that people need that right now. Right. And also, and also, you know, even beyond the pandemic, there's going to be ensembles that would benefit from these because, you know, we, you know especially like, if you th I mean, I'm sure like in West Virginia, just like in Arkansas, there are a lot of, you know, small rural Absolutely. communities where the entire band might be 10 kids. Absolutely. You know, and uh, because, you know, I think the stereotype of band is so much, you know, these big marching bands, these big like, concert bands, people forget there are these like almost chamber-ish ensembles. And just because the ensembles are small do not mean that the students are not talented, that they're not, you know, capable. Um, it's just an instrumentation problem. So on the one hand, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is rewarding to have these items available. And I'm sure, you know, programs like that are really enjoying this right now because there's so much material being produced. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the school that I taught at was very small and, uh, the thing we always struggled with was just finding repertoire that would work. Right. Um, not because of ability, but because of orchestration. And of course right. I would have to rewrite, I would have to, you know, do all that. Um, and you know, being a band director, you don't always have time to do that. You know, you don't always have time to sit down and rewrite 15 parts just because you need to play something. So, so that's good. On the negative side, I will say that, uh, you know, as a composer, for me, part of the orchestra, part of part of the composing process, a big part is orchestration. And with right. flex with flex band, it's you know, you're to a degree, you're taking that element away. You know, you're like just basically saying it's going to be whatever instruments. And um, I get that, and I understand that, but I don't, I'm not going to lie, I don't like it. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, one thing I'm doing with my company that is uh, we're trying to kind of find a sweet middle ground I and mean, we've got the, the flex pieces you know just like everybody else does but we're also doing a series of pieces that are called our modular wind ensemble pieces okay and so what these are are they're you know higher end pieces you know like grade three and up um that they're not flex they're not flex at all they're written for specific instruments but they are very cross cued and very like written in a way where you will still get a genuine orchestration, but it's achievable. Like, um, you know, the one I've just released is uh, playable by as few as 13 players. Okay. Um, you know, you could see, you could successfully play it with those few players. And uh, so I'm, I'm working on a whole series of those because I actually think those will in the long term, like post pandemic, right. will have a greater shelf life. Um, just because they will still sound very symphonic and orchestral, but still be achievable by a smaller group. So oh, that's great. I, I, Cause I agree with you. I think sometimes you lose the, the colors and the, the different textures that you can create from a wind symphony piece that um, get lost in these flex band things. So right, that's really right. great. So what are your musical inspirations? Like what gets you going? What do you listen to? What do you, what, what kind of gets you going in the morning well i mean as far as what i listen to what don't i listen to um, <laughs> I'm not, i mean my musical tastes are extremely eclectic um i i just tell people like i really don't have a preference as far as genre of music goes yeah um i am very attracted to specific pieces sometimes specific artists but mostly just individual songs individual compositions mm -hmm. um that really speak to me um i tend to get very inspired by um pop music um, okay. I mean, I, I love pop music. And when I say pop, I don't just mean, just mean like pop pop. Um, I just mean like popular culture. So things like, I mean, anything on the radio, you know, like, you know, pop, rock, rap, country, hip hop, all of it. I just, right. I value, I value all of that music, you know, jazz. I consider jazz to be pop as well. You know, it's a popular style. Of course, that's what um, I And then, um, but even beyond that, like um, video game music, uh, cinematic music, so film scores, uh, Broadway, things like that. So the the pop uh, overall, you know, sensibility really speaks to me, and it and especially as of late, as I've been more comfortable writing what I would call my authentic voice into my music, uh -huh. it has really really come through in a variety of pieces, and I think very successfully. Um, but um, you know, having said that, I also listen to a lot of symphonic things. I mean, you know, I listen to of, of course the classics, but I'm always looking for new 
wind ensemble recordings new orchestral recordings new choral recordings um i don't know if you know or not but you know like eric whitaker just put out a new album uh, full oh, of yeah. uh, choral stuff and it's beautiful it's wonderful um yeah, yeah. and uh, so i listened to all of that um but i will say for me my biggest inspirations just come from the music itself um and what i mean by that is uh like just the sound of a particular chord or the sound of a right. particular melody. I tend to treat music very, very abstractly. Um, and I think that's because I mainly write instrumental music. I mean, I've mm -hmm. written some vocal things, but you know, instrumental music for me by its very nature is abstract. There is really no meaning behind it. Now that's not to say that a composer like myself or anybody else didn't, you know, have an idea or have a narrative they're trying to portray. But for an audience member, the experience, it should and is totally abstract and totally aesthetic. Yes. Um, because there is no word or no narrative. And for me, um, I could have the best story behind a piece, but if the piece itself sucks, <laughs> it, does not, it does not matter how good the story behind it or the inspiration or the intent. The piece has to work on its own merits. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, I try to let most of my inspiration come from you know, the actual just abstract music. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, I, th I think for me it works. I, ca I can't say it would work for everybody else, but for me it works. Well, it's that age-old question, is music a universal language? And I had a teacher one time tell me, no, it's not, because it doesn't always mean the same thing to a large group of people. It might have that intent, and a lot of people might interpret I, it that way, but is it truly universal language? It's an interesting thought. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, would, I would agree with your professor, because, you know, by, you know, again, that whole abstract nature of it, um, it's, you know, you, the, the point of language is to be understood. Mm -hmm. And the point of music is not to be understood, it's to make you feel. Wow. So it's more of a, it's more of a universal. Now I can say it's probably more of a universal empathetic experience, but I would not go as far as to call it language. Sure. Great. Yep. So what would you say to an inspiring composer? What would you tell them advice or, or anything? Um, the biggest thing, well, I, I can probably narrow it down to about three points of advice. The first would be write every single day. Um, if, I mean, if you're going to be a composer, be a composer you know, write every single day, get your thoughts out, examine them, do that. Second thing, listen to as much music as possible. I mean, just, uh, and, and listen to genres you would normally not listen to. Listen to artists you haven't heard before. Um, you know, keep an open ear because you, it may inspire some thought in your own head mm -hmm. that, you, that would not have been there otherwise. And the third thing I would say is get very, very good at editing. Um, because this is where I strongly feel a lot of composers fail. Um, I think a lot of composers are really good writers and about half of them are really good editors. What do you mean by editing? Um, so what I mean by editing is when you finish like a first draft or a second draft or whatever, um, kind of taking a step back from the piece and be, and honestly, the question I ask myself is what can this piece live without? <laughs> you know, like what does it not need? Um, and uh, because, you know, it's very easy to just kind of fall in love with things you've written and not want to cut it out. Right. Um, I, I, I like almost have a percentage thing where when I finish a piece, I purposely try to find between 10 to 20% of it to cut out. And uh, just, you know, that way, while all that we're left with are the really, really good parts. It's like that piece of fashion advice where they say to take off an accessory before you leave the house. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Take out one little piece. And, <laughs> and uh, but then, so that's, that's the, like one side of editing. The other side I would say is taking a step back from a piece and really examining its elements and finding out what, what is the piece really about aesthetically? Um, you know, what motives uh, you know, recurred in a certain spot, but may not be referenced here. And can you bring that cross connection across to give that musical gesture more meaning and okay. more, you know, more emphasis. Right. Um, so I, so, but, you know, kind of just dissecting the piece and really getting to its meat, because I think sometimes when composers finish a piece, there's a little bit of creative exhaustion that, that, you know, oh, I'm comes sure. in where it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, 
you, you know, when you've been like, when you might be with your best friend or your partner or your spouse or whatever, and you've just been around, yeah, people in the pandemic can probably relate to this a lot right now. And you've just been around them way too much. <laughs> and you just kind of look at them and it's like, it, you know, it's, it's not, you're not exactly tired of them, but you could do with a day or two of just being somewhere else. Right yep. then, you know? Yeah. That's uh that's kind of how you, I think composers get with their pieces where it's like, you know, they, they just kind of look at it and it could be the best thing they've written. But after, you know, a few weeks or even a month of working on it, you're just like, I am so sick of you. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of, a, no, kind, kind of kind of a love hate relationship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let's talk about not music. What do you like to do for fun? What have you been doing during this pandemic to keep yourself sane? And well, um, the, uh, uh, I mean, aside from writing music, I would say I'm a very big geeky person. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's big no other way. To, guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause there's no other way to describe it. I'm just a big geek. Like, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I like, you know, comic books. Um, I like video games. I love movies. Um, I'm a big bookworm. I read all the time. And even when I'm not reading, um, I'll be listening to audiobooks. Yeah. I've also really gotten into podcasts during the Me pandemic. Too. Um, yeah, I, I was not before, but now I think it's going to be just a part of something I enjoy. Um, That's what I do and, at the gym. I listen to podcasts now. Yeah. And, and there's, there's kind of this renaissance of podcasts right now, you know, where, yeah. and, and there's just some really great stuff. And I, th I think the, there's become this, uh, this stereotype of podcasts where it's all like somebody just talking about a subject or whatever or this but there's so many other like i've gotten into a lot of what are essentially radio dramas um you know just these shows and things like there's this one yeah. that i'm listening to right now um i was trying to find something kind of creepy for october you know the halloween season halloween. and i found this one podcast that i really love uh called uh the video palace the and video what uh the video palace Oh, okay. And and it's it's just creepy. It's like this creepy story about about these mysterious videotapes, uh, and it's it's just neat. Yeah. I was listening to that and this other one that's pretty popular called Lore. Yeah. And um, it's about yeah. folklore, and uh, so I and I'm just um, plus I'm learning Spanish right now, and I found a Spanish that's like it's like a podcast that's hat in half Spanish, half English, back and forth. And the idea being wow. that it helps, it helps your cognitive abilities uh, sure. with the language. And uh, it's, it seems, I mean, like language is hard, like English was hard enough for me. So like learning Spanish is a, a whole other thing, uh, but I'm enjoying it, you know? Yeah. And then aside from all that, I'm also a big gym person. Um, I okay. go to the gym at least once a day, uh, sometimes twice. At least. Uh, yeah. Now I wasn't, you know, during the um, initial lockdowns and everything, I was doing a lot of workout at home. Um, our gyms here have opened up within safety protocols. And so I've right. been going back and doing that um, and, you know, following the, the protocols, I'm very happy to say. Um, so uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, aside from that, uh, you know, I've got a pretty active uh, home life, uh, you know, with my, with my husband and, and with our dogs. What uh, kind of dogs do you have? Uh, spoiled. That is what kind of dogs <laughs> I have. No, they are, uh, no, they're, uh, um, one is a uh, dachshund beagle mix. Okay. Um, so we call her a beagle. And then the <laughs> other one is uh, a dachshund corgi mix, so a dorgy. Oh. And uh, we don't really have a thing for dachshunds. It just kind of happened that way. Like sure. it, was, it was just a coincidence. Um, but but they're, just, they're just really fun. Uh, the boy dog is very much a jock. Um, like he is, he is very active, you know, wants to play, wants to run, wants to fetch, wants to play tug of war all the time like he's yeah. never satisfied you know with there's never enough play time um the girl dog on the other hand is more like the spoiled princess like she wants to be by you she wants to be in your lap you know it's like in the evening she's you know cuddle me pet me you know spoil yep. me and that that's her gig like that's what she does um and then we also have three cats um all of whom were on accident like <laughs> i promise i am not a crazy cat person um but uh Anyway, just through some some circumstances, we ended up with three cats, and they're great pets. Like yeah. I'm not sorry. It is more cats than I was ever anticipating having in my life. Though. <laughs> what kind of video games you playing? Um, well, during October, I played a lot of um, scary games. You know, yeah. so ones that kind of cause anxiety. And I played this one in particular called Outlast. Uh, that was uh, it's basically sent in or set in a mental asylum and you're like trying to sell and you can't fight like there you have no combative powers all you can do is run and hide um, and so it was probably the most anxiety inducing uh, you know uh, thing that I've ever played um, and they, a, they also made a video game of the Blair Witch Project 
It was just called Blair Witch. Wow. And it was pretty it was pretty terrifying. Like it was it was one of the scarier games I've played. So awesome. yeah. And I just downloaded last night, um, because you know, I so I had my October, you know, Halloween thing with all these games where you're basically powerless and can't fight. I was like, well, I'm gonna re empower myself now. So <laughs> I uh, last night I downloaded Doom Eternal. Um, oh, yeah. So, so yeah, that, so after I get done with work today, there's going to be a lot of, you know, blowing up demons and things like that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's my turn to go on the offensive right, right. now, you know. Oh, that's funny. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time today. You are so engaging on social media. You know, you mentioned one of your pieces that, um, that you just published that I saw you were asking for feedback on titles on. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Was... That, was, <clears throat> that was actually that Shadow Cove thing. Yeah, that was super um, cool. Where yeah, can they was... find you online? Oh, okay, online? Uh, oh, they, they can find me all over the place. Uh, <laughs> so, well, first of all, you know, I have my uh, main webpage, which is okay. uh, w- www.randallstandridge.com. You know, just pretty simple. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have two pages. I have my my personal page and then my composer's page. Although, honestly, I, I post more on my personal page and people are welcome to follow me. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, I, I keep things pretty fun and light on that page yeah. um, because I, I have a rule. I don't argue with people on social media. Like, I'm just not, not going to do that. <laughs> I, I don't engage in that. If people want to, you know, talk to me, they can talk to me in person. That's just how it is. Um, <clears throat> I will, I'll, about that stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, if people want to send me a message and ask a question, that's fine. Um, I get that a lot, and I try to answer every single message I get. Um, let's say I'm also on, I've got a YouTube channel um, that I've been putting educational stuff on, as well as demos of things that I'm writing. Um, I'm on TikTok, although TikTok is more just silly stuff. Well, again, thank you so much, Randall. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us, and uh, wish you the best of luck uh, as you continue on this publishing company and writing music. Well, thank you very much. And if uh, I can ever be of service to you and your students, please don't hesitate to let me know. Absolutely. Thank you.